Well, it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure for me to introduce Reverend Wright to you, or Tom, as I know him. And uh, I've, I've looked at his CV, and I'm amazed, I'm overwhelmed, and so I'm going to give you a very short version of the short version so that I don't encroach too much on his own time. But um, Dr. Wright has uh, had various uh, positions from the 70s on through the 80s and uh, indeed on into the 90s at uh, Cambridge and at Oxford. He also, uh, by the way, served for uh, five years or so as an assistant professor of New Testament language and literature at McGill University in Montreal. So he is uh, known to Canada, and Canada is known and familiar to him. In 1994 to 99, he was the uh, dean of Litchfield, and uh, 2000 to 2003, the canon theologian of Westminster Abbey. And from 2003 to the present, he is the Bishop of Durham. He's been uh, honored in a variety of capacities, uh, honorary degrees at various schools in recent years. He's published, uh, by my count, at least uh, as his CV is as of September 2006, more than 50 books. And among these books would be The Climax of the Covenant in 1991, the, in 1992, The New Testament and the People of God, and this is a first volume of a projected six-volume series, of which now uh, three volumes have appeared, and Dr. MacDonald referred to one, The Resurrection of the Son of God, is in that series as well. Following Jesus, Biblical Reflections on Christian Discipleship in 1994, The Original Jesus, 1996, by the way, translated into Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, French, and Finnish. Many of his books, in fact, are translated into other languages, and I'm glad to hear of that and to know that uh, his important work is widely disseminated throughout the world. Uh, the Challenge of Jesus, 1999, also available in Chinese. The Resurrection of the Son of God, that has won various prizes. The uh, Association of Theological Booksellers Religious Book of the Year 2003 Award and the Michael Ramsey Prize 2005. In 2005... Paul, Fresh Perspectives, at least the British title, the U.S. title is Paul in Fresh Perspective. In 2006, Evil and the Justice of God, and also uh, just out, and I just saw it, uh, Judas and the Gospel of Jesus, which I suspect we will have the record set straight on all that Gospel of Judas fanfare that, that has been with us since April. He also is the author of a multi-volume New Testament commentary for everyone. And so uh, that's one of the things I really appreciate about Bishop Wright. He's able to take very deep and profound learning and make it accessible for non-experts, for the people in the pew, and for people who are seekers outside the church wondering what is going on and what does the New Testament really teach. He's also edited the, theological dic the Dictionary for Theological Interpretation of Scripture in 2005, as well as volumes in honor of of Gordon Fee of Regent College and the late George Caird of Oxford. So without further introduction, I give to you Dr. Wright, who will be speaking to us tonight on apocalyptic and postmodernity. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Lee. Thank you all for being here. And thank you particularly for the warm welcome that Maggie and I have received and the wonderful hospitality that we are already enjoying. Though, as has been said, we are no strangers to Canada, we had not, I'm afraid, made it to Nova Scotia before. I guess this wasn't exactly the best time of the year to come, but it's very good to be here. I've heard a great deal about Acadia over the years, and it's, it's excellent to be with you and to sample this, I gather, very new facility here and uh, to, to, to feel uh, the university as a thriving and lively community and to be part of it, albeit for this brief time. My overall theme for these three nights is the resonance of the Bible in today's new and often worrying world. I shall explain in due course what I mean by postmodernity, and suffice it to say here that I'm asking overall, uh, and doing so, of course, quite briefly. One could go on for weeks, and indeed some of us do go on for weeks about these things, but I'm trying to put a quart into a pint pot here. I'm asking overall the question of how the Bible can inform some of the key debates which face us at this moment of social and cultural and political uncertainty.
And for that, I shall need to offer some fresh readings of Scripture, some fresh angles on familiar themes and texts. And I want to offer an invitation to rethink some of the most basic aspects of what might be called the biblical worldview. Uh, a lot of people who think that they hold the biblical or a biblical worldview are rather surprised when they discover that other people use the same language but mean something quite different by it. And so I'm trying to get in in the middle of that. Uh, nobody else much uh, seems to be leading the way through post-modernity and out the, out the other side. Public discourse in our world is regularly reduced to either spin or shouting. And uh, certainly that's true where I come from. It's true in the United States and I suspect even in Canada these things are not unknown. And my proposal, which is going to be, as you will detect, advanced obviously from three different angles in these lectures, is that a fresh reading of the Bible in the areas of the apocalyptic imagination tonight, of the arts tomorrow night, and of global ethics on the third night, can offer fresh ways of stating urgent questions and perhaps even of groping towards some kind of answers. So in this first lecture, I want to suggest a rereading of what may be called apocalyptic. I'm aware there are some people in this room who've written more than I on apocalyptic and similar matters, and I'm taking my life in my hands a bit. And I want to suggest a rereading, anyway, of apocalyptic in the New Testament, and to suggest that this rereading impacts upon our present cultural situation and moment in ways which open up new possibilities of engagement. So first, the problems of apocalyptic. Apocalyptic has often been a puzzle to Western readers of the New Testament, so puzzling, in fact, that some still make the presence of apocalyptic in the canon of Scripture an excuse for refusing to do business with the Bible without at least some drastic surgery. We're going to have to cut all that stuff out if we want to actually get to grips with it. Well, that was substantially Rudolf Bultmann's answer to Albert Schweitzer nearly a century ago, if Jesus really was an apocalyptic prophet announcing the end of the world and being swiftly proved wrong, then let us look instead not at Jesus and such a crazy proclamation, but at the life and work of the early church and the structure of faith within that church. And in particular, then, apocalyptic has been understood, and I shall suggest misunderstood, in terms of the imminent expectation of the end of the space-time world, conceived in some quite realistic fashion, the implosion or collapse of the actual universe as we know it. And some people have even thought quite straightforwardly that the phrase kingdom of God itself refers in the New Testament to the arrival of a new non-spatio-temporal order in which the cosmos as we know it would have disappeared and been replaced with something else altogether. And rightly or wrongly, that is how apocalyptic within the New Testament, not least within the message of Jesus, has been understood for much of the century since Albert Schweitzer wrote his famous book, Quest for the Historical Jesus, which came out a hundred years ago this year in, was that in its English translation or its, in its German original? In German original. I knew some, one of the wonderful things about getting to my age is that you can drop questions like this and somebody in the front row knows the answer. Which is, um, English 1910, you see, this is very good, yes. Um, uh, right, there'll be some more questions later on, Dr. Evans, thank you very much. As a result, it's been widely assumed that since Jesus and the early Christians believed that the world would come to an end soon and that they were proved wrong, we who have discovered their mistake, as though we were the first generation to notice that the world had not ended in the first century, um, we must reevaluate what they said about everything else, jettisoning some things altogether, and if we can, salvaging others from the embarrassing wreckage. Thus, for instance, all that can be said from this point of view about New Testament ethics is that, well, it was a kind of martial law, an interim ethic for the brief period between the proclamation of Jesus and the eventual arrival of the kingdom. But those of us who are conscious of a protracted delay are going to have to revise the early Christians' bracing ethical teaching in the light of this much more relaxed time scale. You can't really expect to take all that hard teaching of Jesus seriously if the world's going on for another couple of thousand years. That's the attitude that many have taken. Now, I'll come back to that presently, but let me hurry on to the second type of problem which nests within the first, albeit somewhat cuckoo fashion, perhaps even cloud cuckoo fashion. And this is the cheerfully literal reading of apocalyptic language, 
within mainline fundamentalism, especially of the dispensationalist type, in which, for instance, the predictions of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 have been taken in a straightforwardly concrete fashion in terms of a supposed forthcoming rapture with the saints being caught up to heaven while the world faces its doom. I can't resist telling you the lovely story of Professor Robin Scroggs in Union Theological Seminary in New York, who was asked one day by a student, please, Professor Scroggs, what is the parousia? And he said, one day you will look out of the window and you'll see all these people going up in the air and you'll say to yourself, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> Now, now this, this concrete rapture, notoriously, has become the subject of an entire second-order mythology in the form of the Left Behind series of books, which many of you will know. I've written about this elsewhere, and I just want to make three quick comments. First, to locate this reading hermeneutically. The dispensationalist agrees with Schweitzer that the language of apocalyptic is to be taken literally and concretely, but it ignores or passes over the problem of why this literal event didn't happen in the first generation. I well, say ignores or passes over. Some people have developed interesting theories about that, but they seem to me deeply unconvincing. Second, to characterize this reading cosmically, it is a thoroughly dualist reading in which the space-time universe is largely irrelevant to the purposes of God, since God is really only interested in saving souls, and the space-time universe, rather, is a place which God's people ought to be glad to escape, which points on to the Gnosticism, which is all too popular in North American culture just now, but one might have hoped that Christians of a conservative disposition would be eager to avoid that kind of idea. Not so often. Thirdly, on the rapture theology, to point it up ethically, it leaves the believer with the task merely of guarding one's own ethical purity against the day of rapture, but without any responsibility for the continuing political or social or indeed ecological life of the present cosmos. And this is a different kind of interim ethic to that of Schweitzer, though it bears an interesting family likeness. That's the second problem that we have with apocalyptic language in the uh, conservative dispensationalist Protestantism. The third type of problem with apocalyptic language and imagery in the New Testament is the worrying confluence between the apparent prediction of cosmic catastrophe in the first century and the apparently increasing likelihood of a man-made cosmic catastrophe in our own time. And I mean man-made. Few self-respecting women would dream of such a thing. Despite the end of the Cold War, we find ourselves still in a dangerous world where several nations, not just one or two superpowers, have the capacity and might discover the will to blast their neighbors or enemies off the planet. Indeed, our present political propensity towards apocalyptic scenarios feeds directly and obviously off that second type of problem. If true believers are going to be raptured when Armageddon comes, why not hurry up with Armageddon so that we can enjoy the moment all the sooner? And even if it won't happen through nuclear war, why worry about global warming and climate change if the world is in any case destined for the scrap heap? These and other reflections have been highlighted in a very interesting recent work by Professor Duncan Forrester called Apocalypse Now, which I read after I'd written the first draft of this lecture and found myself in very interesting debate and dialogue with him. And I've since sent him an earlier copy of the lecture which you're hearing tonight, and we've continued with that dialogue. I'm not going to try and continue that, as it were, in public now. It would be too complex. But I want you to know that's an important book which is out there and relates quite closely to what I'm trying to do. At a more popular but a telling level, there was an article by one of our London columnists, Libby Purvis, in the London Times earlier this year, um, where she described the increasing tendency to worry about the end of the world and nuclear fallout and all the rest of it as a post-Christian phenomenon. And she said, instead, if you take a Christian point of view, you will conclude that, quote, something beyond our understanding dumped us here in the first place and something equally uncontrollable will whisk us away. She said, if you think about it that way, the end of the world is quite a comforting idea. Well, it is and it isn't. But that illustrates at least part of the misunderstanding which this lecture is trying to combat. <laughs>
Faced with these options, many Christians today, at both the scholarly and the popular level, opt to sidestep apocalyptic altogether and concentrate on the so-called spiritual or mystical or ethical readings of traditional texts. And the increasingly popular neo-gnosticism of, quote, discovering who I really am, unquote, which is a deep cultural imperative in North America and in Europe, leads one inwards rather than outwards, so that what really matters, quote-unquote, is personal fulfillment or authenticity. And it's often said that at the point of compassionate contemplation, all the great religions are, after all, one. If you look inside deep enough and feel it strongly enough, then it's really not a lot of fuss, whether you call yourself a Christian or a Buddhist or anything else. And this, as you may see, is actually a low-grade repeat of Bultmann's response to Schweitzer, but the millions who gobble up the Da Vinci Code and other popular expositions of neo-agnosticism wouldn't recognize this or care if they did, I suspect. My argument will run the other way. I propose that apocalyptic was indeed the mother of Christian theology, as Ernst Kesemann once said, that apocalyptic is central to the biblical narrative, and that properly understood, it opens the door to a richer and more complex worldview than has been supposed, enabling the reader of the New Testament to engage with our world, our postmodern world, in a much more nuanced and effective way than its alternatives. So I want to begin with the ubiquity of apocalyptic. It's all over the place, not just in the two or three places that people normally see. The whole New Testament, by no means only a few chapters here and there and one single book at the end, demands to be understood in terms of the unveiling of things normally hidden. That, properly speaking, the unveiling of things normally hidden, is what apocalyptic, one might suppose, should refer to. Not simply, in other words, the imminent expectation of the end of the world, but the pulling back of the cosmic curtain. Here I am with a curtain behind me. I don't know if everyone can see it. But it, imagine there is some wonderful secret kept, behind, kept from the rest of you and that I have the chance to pull a string and reveal all. That's what apocalypse is about, the unveiling of something which is otherwise hidden, the opening of eyes to secret realities. Of course, the word apocalyptic has got a long and complex history within theological and exegetical discourse. But if we trace it to its root... Not that I'm suggesting that meaning is always purely a function of etymology, but you see where I mean. Um, this is where we shall arrive. And in particular, the New Testament repeatedly returns to what can properly be called eschatological apocalyptic. That is to say, the idea that the Creator God has for a very long time had a plan for what he wanted to do eventually. So far, it's been a closely guarded secret, but from the New Testament's point of view, this secret has been or is about to be revealed, unveiled, in an action or event. New Testament apocalyptic, therefore, is not simply about people being allowed to glimpse timeless secrets, as it were, the platonic forms or ideas behind the visible universe, but about the revelation of the Creator's long-term purpose for the creation, in much the same way that when an apple appears on a tree at a certain time of the year, I wrote this sentence before I realized just how important apples are in this part of the world, um, then the apple reveals or unveils what, so to speak, the tree had been about all along. If you didn't know that it was an apple tree, suddenly when this thing arrives, ah, that's the sort of tree it was. That's what this purpose was all about. And when the Creator's purposes are thus unveiled in action, when something happens which makes it clear this is what God was about all along, a new state of affairs has come into being. Once that unveiling has taken place, something has happened which can't be unhappened. Nothing can ever be quite the same. The world has changed. And to read the New Testament in this way is not entirely new. Lots of other people have done it before me, but my experience doing so can open up all kinds of fresh approaches to problems we face in the church and the world today. And uh, seeing Professor Alison Trites here reminds me that, of course, he and I sat at the feet of uh, Professor George Caird in Oxford, and maybe others here did as well, I don't know. 
and George Caird is one of the great gurus on apocalyptic and what he wrote in his book The Language and Imagery of the New Testament and in other places is still worth going back to, more than worth going back to, um, for fresh ideas which much of the rest of New Testament scholarship didn't really take as seriously as they should when he first said them. A few examples deliberately chosen from passages and books not normally accused of being apocalyptic. The letter to the Hebrews defines faith in terms of being assured of things not seen, and it backs this up with tales of heroes who acted as they did because they were looking both to the God who is invisible and to his future as yet unrealized purposes. The point being for Hebrews that these purposes are now realized and brought to light in Jesus of Nazareth. Likewise, John's Jesus tells Nathanael that he will see heaven opened. In other words, the curtain pulled back. Classic apocalyptic language. In John's Gospel of all places, did you know John was an apocalyptic writer? And the angels of God will be seen ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Likewise again, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians not always thought of as apocalyptic, speaks of the revelation of the secret plan kept hidden for ages by the Creator. The plan that through the multi-ethnic people of God, the many-coloured wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That example is all the more remarkable in that this time the apocalypse appears to work in reverse. Earthly events, the unity of humanity in Christ, function to unveil God's truth to the heavenly principalities and powers. Colossians 3 speaks of a presently hidden truth, not simply about Jesus, but about all those who belong to him. You have died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. In other words, your life, your true life, is a reality behind the screen. And one day when the screen is pulled back, who you really are will be revealed. We know, says John, says First John, in the same way, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Greek in those cases, First John 3 and Colossians 3, is phanerothe, not apocalyptotai, but the point is the same. It's an apocalypse, an unveiling of something which is true but presently hidden. And when we look for uses of the word apocalyptic itself, we come upon one of the most famous summaries of Paul's thought. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because in the gospel, God's righteousness, justice, dikaizune anyway, is revealed, apocalyptotai. The curtain has been pulled back. When the gospel is preached, in other words, when Paul announces to a surprised and unready world that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he is the world's true Lord, then the curtain is pulled back and his hearers find themselves gazing directly on the previously hidden truth of the saving justice of the God of Abraham. Now, there are, of course, plenty more obvious examples of apocalypse in the New Testament. Jesus is revealed, unveiled, disclosed, apocalypsed to Paul on the road to Damascus. At Jesus' baptism, heaven is opened, the Spirit descends, the voice declares him to be the beloved Son. This is, again, classic apocalyptic scenario. Jesus declares in Mark 4 that God's mysteries are now unveiled to the disciples, but not to those outside. In Matthew 16, he affirms that God himself has revealed to Peter that he, Jesus, is the Messiah. You couldn't have figured that out by yourself, he says. Flesh and blood didn't make this clear to you. It's happened because an unveiling has taken place. And all this shows that when we finally get to the book of Revelation, the apocalypse so-called, it isn't, as many have suggested, an odd excrescence tacked on at the end of the New Testament, or rather glued on at the outside, linked only to a few random passages like Mark 13 or 1 Thessalonians 4. No, the notion of apocalypse taken in this wide but arguably appropriate sense pervades the whole of early Christianity, and if we are to be true to Jesus and the earliest Christians, I think we should make it central to our worldview as well. That's quite a challenge. This proposal will, of course, raise eyebrows in various quarters. In partial response to the implied criticisms, we must stress that in all these examples, and many more that could have been adduced, the question of the end of the world in the supposedly Schweitzerian sense simply isn't in view, I believe. Indeed, it wouldn't be the point. 
to be sure. It is about the coming to an end of an era in world history and with it the coming to an end of a way of seeing the world because once Jesus has been revealed as God's Messiah and in particular once he's been raised from the dead nothing can be the same again. But none of the passages that I've mentioned envisages that the space-time universe is going to come to a stop. It's rather like all the language in Jeremiah and so on about the day of the Lord. Part of the problem about the day of the Lord in Jeremiah and elsewhere is that there will be a tomorrow. And when the day of the Lord happens and judgment falls on Jerusalem, uh, a lot of people be, would be rather re re relieved if that had been the end of the space-time world, but it wasn't. And there was a very unpleasant tomorrow to wake up to. So you can envisage apocalyptic, eschatological events, cataclysmic events, which nevertheless do not mean the end of the space-time universe. The closest we come to the major transformation, at least, of the space-time universe is Romans 8, where the present creation, currently groaning in travail, will give birth to the new world. And likewise in Revelation 20 and 21, where the new heavens and the new earth replace the old. Do they replace it? Do they fulfill it? That's a question exegetes argue about. But in both cases, we are as impressed, I think, by the continuity between old and new as by the discontinuity. And the key point to grasp, which has been made often enough in the literature of the last 30 years or more, is that apocalyptic language as a rule ought not to be taken literally. I quoted in uh, my book, The New Testament of the People of God, a line which my friend and former colleague John Barton used to use regularly in his lectures in Oxford, that when we read a prophecy saying that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will be turned into blood and the stars will be falling from heaven, we ought to know as a matter of literary genre that the next line will not be that the rest of the country will have scattered showers and sunny intervals. Um, <laughs> this is not a primitive cosmic weather forecast. As with political cartoons, where often you get one politician portrayed as a lion and another as a lamb, or a little further to the south there, one as a donkey and one as an elephant or whatever, <laughs> nobody in the host culture would imagine the artist to be suggesting that the politicians in question had actually been transformed into such animals. Everyone decodes these things very easily. Likewise, when Daniel speaks of four monsters coming up out of the sea, it didn't take a graduate course in scriptural imagery to detect that he was talking about invading pagan armies. And when he spoke of the Son of Man coming on the clouds, well, that would take us a little bit too far right now, but you can see where that's going, perhaps. It's important to notice that the rather obvious examples of apocalyptic in the New Testament have little to do with the literary genre which we know as apocalyptic. Some, of course, do. I've argued elsewhere that Mark 4 should be understood in that way, and that allusion to the Son of Man just now tells its own larger story. But in fact, the labeling of a particular genre with the word apocalyptic, which goes more obviously with books like Revelation and Daniel and so on, may be one of the factors that ironically have blinded readers to what is going on in many places where there is no question of that genre being present. Namely, that the phenomenon of the unveiling of heavenly secrets, especially of their being unveiled through God's fresh action in the world, is far more widespread than the literary genre which happens to have been given the same name. Such are the rods that scholars make for their own backs and sometimes for those of others. So what is this phenomenon really about? The apocalyptic phenomenon, if I can call it that, in the Bible determines to be, uh, demands to be understood within a particular worldview in which certain things need to be said about cosmology, about time, and about matter, space, time, and matter. And this is at the heart of the proposal that I want to make about rethinking a biblical view of the world. And this, therefore, underlies not only today's lecture, but the other two as well, and indeed quite a lot of other thinking in other areas that I'm trying to do simultaneously. So some remarks on space, time, and matter. And first, cosmology. As to cosmology, there is a remarkable unanimity among the biblical writers that the created world consists of two spheres, heaven and earth, and that these two overlap 
and interlock. Heaven is not normally spoken of as the final destination of God's people, or even the place where they go after they die and before they are raised again. This comes as a surprise to a lot of people who grow up assuming that the real name of the game in Christianity is to go to heaven when you die. Well, I've said often enough, heaven is important, but it is not the end of the world. There is a further raising from the dead to inhabit God's new heavens and new earth in the New Testament. And until you get your minds around that, you haven't even got to first base with New Testament eschatology. So heaven is not normally spoken of in the New Testament as the place where we go. Even in Revelation, the vision of the worshipping church in heaven, chapters 4 and 5, is significantly different from that of the slumbering martyrs in chapter 6. The vision in chapters 4 and 5 is the heavenly counterpart of the church worshipping on earth. And then, of course, in chapter 21, the new Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb, will at the last come down from heaven as the ultimate moment of revelation, of apocalypse. Rather, heaven is God's sphere of reality, while earth is the sphere allotted to humans. The heavens are the Lord's, the earth he has given to human children. Heaven can, of course, in the Bible refer to three different entities in the Hebrew Scriptures, the air above the earth where the birds fly, the sky where the stars appear, but beyond that, ontologically and not merely geographically, the domain of God himself, the heaven of heaven, the highest heaven. And it's in that third sense that I'm specially concerned. And sometimes the overlap of heaven in this third sense, an earth, becomes suddenly visible. One of my personal favorites is that lovely one in 2 Kings 6, where Elisha prays that Yahweh will open the eyes of the frightened servant, and he sees the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire round about the prophet, protecting him from the invading Syrians. But for the ancient Israelite, of course, heaven and earth overlapped in the temple in Jerusalem. So that when you went to the temple, it wasn't as if you were going into heaven. You really were going into heaven. That was the place on terra firma where heaven and earth interlocked. And that is the seedbed for much early Christian Christology and pneumatology, since Jesus' followers transferred to Jesus and to the Spirit that which Second Temple Judaism believed about the temple, and for that matter, Torah. Torah becomes another place or means by which heaven and earth were thought to overlap. Thus, from this point of view, apocalyptic is a way of talking about an event in which, again, the normally opaque curtain between those two spheres of reality, heaven and earth, gets pulled back or becomes transparent. And since this was precisely what the early Christians claimed had happened in Jesus and was continuing to happen through the Spirit, it isn't surprising that apocalyptic of various sorts keeps emerging in their writings. So much for the moment about cosmology. There's obviously masses more one could say, but the similar things can be said about time within a biblical worldview. This subject, time, is of course vast in itself. Whole libraries have been written about it, reaching back especially to Augustine's ruminations in Book 2 of the Confessions, and beyond that to Plato and Aristotle. I suggest that we should beware of giving in too easily to the dualism which is implicit when we collapse time into the rather difficult concept of eternity, as though time were a secondary and rather shabby thing which one ought to be glad to escape. Much modern Western Christian language goes in exactly the route that I'm criticizing here, talking of eternity as though that was the thing we all know we really want. Whereas when the New Testament talks about eternal life, zoe aionios, I think strongly, arguably, it means the life of the coming eon, the life of the coming age, in Hebrew, ha'olam hava, as opposed to ha'olam hazeh, the present age, and that we have to think in that Jewish way about the sequence of ages rather than in the Platonic way about eternal life equals some kind of Platonic eternity. We should not forget that the divine verdict, very good, which was spoken over creation, included precisely the sixfold passage from evening to morning. Or that in the final scene of Scripture, the writer envisages new projects starting up, 
as the leaves which grow on the tree of life offer themselves for the healing of the nations. I prefer, therefore, to explore the meaning of time as one of God's mysterious gifts, an aspect of the created order in its goodness, not simply in its fallenness or even its inadequacy. And time within Scripture is hugely important, since time is of the essence of narrative, and most of Scripture as a whole, as well as, as, well as in its parts, is narrative. Indeed, the flight from narrative which has constituted one of the primary rebellions against Scripture in the modern church, not least in the would-be biblical parts of the modern church, is closely allied to the almost contemptuous attitude to time in the same circles. For the biblical writers, time is primarily linear, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Not for nothing is the first word of Scripture, Bereshit, in beginning. There are, of course, atemporal and supratemporal themes all over Scripture, but they are held together not within an essentially cyclic view of time, as in some Hindu and Buddhist schemes of thought, but within a linear movement. It is perhaps a feature of 18th and 19th century thought that just at the point where the Church was abandoning time and narrative in favor of a longing for an atemporal eternity, a new ideology of time, that of evolutionary progress, was making its way into the resulting vacuum through the work of people like Malthus and, of course, one of the climaxes being Darwin. But the linear movement of time in Scripture is never simple, and this, too, is of the essence of apocalyptic, that God's time, while celebrating the linear movement, the onward movement, of earthly time continually works in a different and a complementary way. Not simply that eternity shafts its way into time from time to time, so to speak. Rather, that the past can become present, a feat that we associate primarily with memory, which is what Augustine's talking about in the Confessions at that point, including the encoding of genetic inheritance and which the biblical writers ascribe remarkably enough to God's memory, that God remembers, didn't I promise Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob I was going to do something about just this mess? Right, probably time to be getting on with that. And so that God comes to the rescue of enslaved Israel because something that's happened in the past becomes present again for God, and so he acts. But more particularly, the future can also become present. The Israelites taste in advance while they're still in the wilderness the fruit from the promised land. Every time there's a new king in Israel, however obviously inadequate he may be, they greet him with royal psalms which proclaim the coming of God's kingdom of justice and peace. And this apparent interruption of the linear temporal sequence by both past and future is a kind of unveiling, a pulling back of the curtain that hides past and future from our normal present and the allowing of God's past and God's future to transform the earthly present. This isn't a way of saying then that actually it's just eternity doing its stuff and scraping time aside and saying, no, we've got something much more important. No, time itself, the past and the future, are working into the present. Linear time matters but by contrast with the parody of linear time offered by the dogma of evolutionary progress, linear time is regularly shot through with replays and anticipations of things past and things future. And when this happens, the language of apocalyptic is the appropriate one to reach for within the context of eschatology in which God's purposes for the future are unveiled within the present. And as with cosmology, this, of course, comes to its focal point in Jesus Christ. We have a whole section here on Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ as the arche, the beginning, um, as, uh, as well as the image, the one in and through and for whom all things were made. So thirdly, as with cosmology and time, so with matter itself. The whole earth, sang the seraphim in Isaiah's hearing, is full of God's glory. The prophet glimpses the celebration of something which is always true, though usually hidden. How one can say that the earth is already full of God's glory and, as the prophets do, that there will come a future time 
when the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea? That is a question which I shall be dealing with, God willing, tomorrow night. Uh, it appears to anticipate that matter admits of the same double significance that I have suggested in relation to time. At one level, the material universe, of course, exhibits all the signs of being obedient to what we think of as the normal laws of physics and motion and so on. As it stands, the world remains God's good creation and is to be celebrated as such, not interrupted or invaded, quote-unquote, by bizarre suspensions of its God-given harmonies. But at another level, it is, to quote Hopkins, who's kind of a light motif through these lectures, charged with the grandeur of God, which sometimes flames out and at other times appears to be obliterated by the trampling generations. But even at the latter times, it is, as it were, resting, waiting patiently for the new dawn, when, by the power of the brooding Holy Spirit, as in Romans, as in Romans 8 and Genesis 1, it, the created order, will be renewed, recharged, so to speak, with God's glory, this time fully and forever. The moments of flaming out in the present, and Hopkins, of course, has in mind the burning bush, uh, are moments of apocalypse, of revelation, both of what is already true and of what will become true. And this, as with cosmology, as with time, likewise reaches its supreme moment in the matter, the human flesh and the risen body of Jesus Christ. Apocalyptic is thus, I suggest, an appropriate word to designate the mystery at the heart of the biblical worldview. Christian thinking has been all too ready to backslide from this robust biblical affirmation of the goodness of creation and to write off the world of space, time and matter as inherently evil and so to be done away with in God's eventual future. But the problem of evil identified by the biblical writers, not, of course, without puzzles and many further questions, consists not in earthboundness, nor in temporal progression, nor yet in materiality, but in ungrateful rebellion embodying itself in idolatry. What's wrong with the world is not that we have space, time and matter, but that we have turned our backs on the living God who made us. And this means that when the moment of unveiling happens, with heaven being open to earth, with the future arriving in the present, with the word becoming flesh, this inevitably involves judgment, even though that is not the primary purpose of the revelation in question. And that is why, too, the major and obvious moments of revelation in Scripture are often simultaneously moments of call and commissioning, as with Moses or Samuel or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Paul, or even in the baptism narratives, Jesus himself. Apocalypse happens, in other words. The unveiling of God's secret plans happens in order that further apocalypse may happen, that further revelation through the prophetic work and witness in which heaven and earth future and present, word and flesh are held together in a combination which is dangerous and explosive as much for the prophet as the hearer. But this brings us to the point where we need a further section of exposition. At the heart of biblical apocalyptic, we find, of course, the promise of new creation. I said in a different lecture in another place a few weeks ago that there hadn't been a whole lot written on new creation in the New Testament um, over the last um, generation or so, and the man who was put up to me, my respondent, proceeded to give me a three-page bibliography of stuff from the last um, uh, 50 years on new creation in the New Testament. Some of it was in rather obscure foreign periodicals, but I still should have known more than I did. But it hasn't been a major theme within New Testament scholarship over the last generation or two. The themes we have studied so far indicate that apocalyptic in the Bible, and not least in the New Testament, is far richer and more creative and indeed complex than the usual end-of-the-world scenario would have us imagine. In particular, it highlights what the New Testament writers are saying about Jesus himself, about Easter, and about ultimate new creation. The New Testament writers, in very different but converging and compatible ways, see Jesus himself as the ultimate apocalypse. It is in this human being, they insist, in his life and his death and his resurrection, 
that the curtain has been drawn back so that the normally hidden reality can be glimpsed. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, declares Paul. And at the same time, he is the first fruits of the new creation. The first small part of that transformed cosmos for which the early Christians hoped. In Jesus, they affirm, the curtain has been drawn back both on God himself and on God's future for the world. So that Jesus' kingdom proclamation in all its aspects, healings and feastings and parables, the call and commissioning of the twelve, confrontation with the powers of the world and of evil, all of that is the unveiling of God. And that's why to this day the church reads the Gospels with a special kind of awe, the kind that is associated in Eastern Orthodoxy at least with standing in front of an icon. A little sense that I take my life in my hand speaking like this in a predominantly Baptist environment, but bear with me. <laughs> the early Christians believed that this is what it looks like when God is on the move, that this is what it looks like when God's kingdom bursts from heaven into a surprised and unready earth. You might note the sequence in Mark 8, where the gradual opening of the eyes of the blind man, until finally he sees everything clearly, points forward to the gradual realization that Jesus is not just a prophet, but is the Messiah himself. That sequence is well enough known, but it's worth just putting it in the context of what I've been saying. But again, granted the state of the world, the unveiling of Jesus always means judgment because God comes, as Karl Marx almost said, not to describe the world but to sort it out. And for that reason, among others, the cross and resurrection of Jesus are seen within the New Testament as the ultimate unveiling of God and of God's kingdom. The cross passes judgment on the evil which has corrupted and infected the world and which threatens to destroy it altogether. And the resurrection launches instead, though with the same raw materials, the new creation, the new kind of creation, a new world with a new sort of time and matter. That is part of what the resurrection narratives are trying to tell us, even though, as Ed Sanders put it, they read like people trying very hard to describe something for which they didn't have appropriate language. The narratives tell the story of Easter and of the disciples' encounter with the risen Jesus in such a way as to indicate both that new creation has begun, John's insistence that Easter is the first day of the new week, very important, and that this new creation is going forward by the rule of following Jesus into an unknown future. And it also says that the disciples are not only beneficiaries of this new creation, but also agents. And that indeed establishes the human and dynamic context for much of what I'm going to say in the remainder of this present lecture, the much shorter um, last bit, and in the two that follow. Within the ongoing narrative of both the Jewish people and the whole creation, the Gospels are very clear about hooking the large story of the whole creation into the Jewish story, drawing them both into the Jesus story. Within that ongoing narrative, events happen within the linear forward movement which constitute both a reprise of the great events of creation, exodus, royal enthronement and return from exile and also an anticipation of events yet to in which the creator will complete the project begun in Genesis 1 and 2 by defeating all the enemies including ultimately death itself which have threatened to overwhelm it. Revelation 21 and 22, where the new Jerusalem comes down like a bride adorned for her husband. And again, often ignored, Ephesians 1, where God's purpose in the Messiah is to sum up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The whole of Ephesians 1, along with Ephesians 3, of which I've already spoken, is another fine example of what I mean by apocalyptic, glimpsing the reality of the ultimate new creation through the lens of the events concerning Jesus themselves to be understood as the fulfillment of the Exodus and of creation itself, and all turned into worship and prayer. With Easter, in fact, time itself has been transformed so that for the early Christians, the new creation has already begun and the church is called to live within the framework of new creation inaugurated but as yet still incomplete. And the many past events within the same linear narrative 
the Exodus, the various days of Yahweh and so on, come into the present and the future comes back into that same present. The apocalypse has happened. God and God's kingdom have been unveiled before the world. There remains yet a further final unveiling, but in between the two, the church is called to live by and as the instrument of a continuing apocalypse. For Paul, the preaching of the gospel is itself the unveiling of God's reconciling, restorative putting to rights of the world. That's what he means in Romans 1, 16 and 17. The gospel is the revelation of the, the saving justice of God. So that the events of gospel proclamation thus themselves partake of the character of apocalyptic, of the unveiling of realities normally opaque. It isn't just the imparting of information or the persuasive use of apologetic arguments, something much more going on. The unv this unveiling of God's justice is a kind of advanced theodicy with the human beings who are caught up by the gospel becoming in themselves advanced signs of the eventual act by which it will become clear that the world's creator has, after all, done all things well. The apocalyptic framework thus helps us to hold together what many readings of Paul have split apart, namely the cosmic and the personal. And this offers us a framework within which we can better understand the early Christians' view of the second coming, of worship, of the sacramental life, and of ethics, though there is no time to explore any of these this week, I fear. So the entire framework of New Testament thought then is indeed apocalyptic, not in the sense that the early Christians expected the space-time universe to come to a sudden end, but in the sense that they believed that the world of space and time and matter had been reclaimed by the Creator through Jesus and would be transformed by him at the last, and that they themselves were caught up within that complex story. But it's more than high time to ask, what on earth has all this got to do with post-modernity. The postmodern turn in everything from literature to architecture, from theology to jazz, has been fully described and much discussed, even though, as I find, people are still very puzzled by the concept, and some people still hope that by reiterating modernist slogans more carefully, they can yet ignore it, like the fabled Englishman abroad speaking English more slowly and loudly so that the natives will get the point. Um, I shall say more about postmodernity and particularly about its political resonances in the third lecture, but for now I want to concentrate on the way in which postmodernity has been hospitable to this reappraisal of apocalyptic, and then to turn it around and suggest, and this is going to be very brief, obviously, suggest some challenges which apocalyptic might put to postmodernity. Basically, the reappraisal of apocalyptic has gone with the postmodern reappraisal of the modernist metanarrative, and there are interesting spin-offs in each direction. Quickly, some definitions and comments to be amplified in the third lecture. By postmodernity, I understand the condition of Western culture after the collapse of the grand narratives that have sustained it, particularly its dreams of progress and enlightenment, for the last 200 years. Just to be clear, I am not anti-enlightenment in the sort of trivial sense that people sometimes suppose. It's much more complicated than that. Of course, postmodernity is itself parasitic on modernity and presupposes it at point after point. One of the most postmodern of activities, the surfing of the boundaryless internet, is entirely dependent on late modern high tech machinery. But the word postmodernity describes a mood in which, to quote a book title by two Canadian authors, truth is stranger than it used to be since all claims to truth are routinely suspected to be claims to power and in which the proud, lonely enlightenment self, the ego, whether the author or the reader of a text or anyone else, has been deconstructed into a mass of signifiers floating in a void. Postmodernity is partly a political reaction to the perception that the great dreams of Western empire have been revealed as morally bankrupt, and it's partly an epistemological outworking of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As you know, when you're observing something, you change the thing which is being observed so that as you're observing it, you can't observe the same thing because it's altering all the time. 
Postmodernity is partly a rejection of brutalist architecture and a playful embrace of stylistic mixture and model. Postmodernity is partly a recognition that when I read a text, the text, so to speak, becomes something different from what it is when you read it. And it is partly, most significantly for our present purposes, a questioning and perhaps rejection of the, of the scientific materialism that has relegated spirituality and the talk of other worlds overlapping with ours to the outdated past of pre-modern superstition. The very word postmodernity carries its own internal and perhaps self-mocking irony since it's precisely one of the main features of postmodernity that one does not believe in the myth of progress as though what comes next in culture or music or whatever is automatically superior to what went before. So postmodernity does not propose a great new scheme, though sometimes it does paradoxically generate its own new meta-narratives. Rather, after the manner of the ancient cynics, postmodernity declares a plague on all your houses and schemes and systems. That is the condition in which many, dare I say even on an august campus like this, find themselves today, at the edge of a moral and cultural abyss with no clear guidelines, quote, lost in epistemological and ethical undecidability, confused by a cacophony of voices calling out their various messages, end of quote. That's a quote from a friend who is uh, a university chaplain in Toronto right now describing where a lot of the people he works with find themselves to be. Even the existential imperative to discover and to be true to who you really are has itself been deconstructed as who is this you person anyway? It shifts confusingly from moment to moment. It's where a great many people in our culture live with their symbolic languages, the random iPod music, indeterminate patterns of sexual behavior, and personality altering recreational drugs. Welcome to the wonderful confusing world of postmodernity. Where does apocalyptic, in whatever definition, impact upon all that, or vice versa? Note for a start that postmodernity owes a great deal to Friedrich Nietzsche, whose important work Beyond Good and Evil... Can you tell me when that was published, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> nice one. He asked which edition I was referring to. Um, uh, was 1886 is the answer. Was prophetically, sub was, was prophetically subtitled Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. But Nietzsche in turn was hugely influential on Albert Schweitzer, whose fresh reading of Jesus the Apocalyptic Prophet owed a great deal to Nietzsche's vision of nihilism, disenchantment, the collapse of ideologies, as well as to his attempts to see how one might come through that moment of despair and out the other side, not least through Nietzsche's genealogical approach, which was in turn highly influential on Michel Foucault. In a roundabout way, therefore, what most people during the last century following Schweitzer understood by apocalyptic was shaped and directed within a worldview, that of Nietzsche's sense of the collapse of all things, with the only thing that's left being the will to power, which has come to fresh flowering within postmodernity. So how has all this played out? Well, faced with the language of apocalyptic, modernity had to choose between Schweitzer and Bultmann. That is, either saying, of course the ancients thought the world was coming to an end and we know they were wrong, or, no, all that's the language of myth and we discover that Jesus was basically an existentialist. Of course, the first of those alternatives then subdivides. The radical modernists said that Jesus thought the world was going to end and he was wrong, but the conservative modernists have said that he thought the world would end and he was right, albeit 2,000 years early. The debate between old-fashioned liberalism and classic fundamentalism, in other words, was always a debate between two modernist readings of Christianity, rather like Jim Wallace's recent book, God's Politics, which is subdivided, Why the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It, which I think is exactly on target. <laughs> but, but once postmodernity has shaken up the modernist meta-narrative, it creates space for all kinds of alternative readings of reality and spirituality and history, not least apocalyptic ones. Not only that of Schweitzer, but also, I suggest, the type I've been proposing, in which a challenge is, proposed, is posed precisely to the modernist understandings of space, time, and matter. 
So then I think that post-modernity, by pointing out that modernity had nothing to lose but its chains, has created a climate with, within which, however paradoxically, fresh historical work can be done. We can open our minds to new possibilities, and within that we can actually get to grips with some things that we'd forgotten in the New Testament. But at the same time, and uh, the fresh reading of Apocalyptic I'm proposing offers a stiff challenge to some aspects of the postmodern worldview. Because insofar as postmodernity has, as I've suggested, embraced the way of nihilism, deconstructing everything in sight, including the person doing the deconstruction, it might be thought that Apocalyptic might be a congenial partner, hence the link between Nietzsche and Schweitzer. But if I'm correct to read early Christian apocalyptic in terms of the unveiling of the heavenly dimension within the earth and of past and present, past and future within the present, and of the transsignification of the material creation, then what we might be witnessing is the construction of part at least of a high road, not back to modernity, nor back to pre-modernity, please no, but through and out the other side into something that you might loosely label post-modernity, post but which we don't know what it looks like yet. This is not at all to underplay the importance of post-modernity in drawing our attention sometimes violently to the inadequacies and hidden power structures of modernity. It is to say that, again following Nietzsche himself, once that voice has been well and truly heard, it's time to find the way through and out culturally, socially, spiritually, politically, into different ways of thinking and being. And this is the underlying theme of these lectures to which I'm going to return in my subsequent ones. And in particular, I'm nearly done. To anticipate my third lecture, one can hardly help remarking that the almost literally earth-shattering moment of September the 11th, 2001, was a moment for which the language of apocalyptic sprang readily to mind, and also a moment which encapsulated all too horribly what post-modernity was about. I'm going to say more about that on, uh, in two days' time. Of course, the response to that terrible day also needs to be mapped on the grid of contemporary culture. The modernist response to evil, evil, thought we got rid of that, we'd banished it by enlightenment. If there's still a bit left, well, I know what we'll do, we'll go and drop some bombs on it and that'll make it all right, won't it? That's what we've done and it was uh, an amazingly naive reaction. Into that sort of scenario, the only way towards any kind of wisdom is, in my judgment, to understand both the postmodern context and a genuinely apocalyptic understanding of what's going on. My friends, our politicians and many other leaders in the Western world are simply flailing around culturally, politically. They have no idea where to go. If we haven't got some wisdom to offer, shame on us. And part of the alternative analysis, reflecting the meaning of apocalyptic for which I've been arguing in this lecture, is to highlight particularly the inherent violence in the meta-narratives by which the world has lived and the way in which, by contrast, the biblical story reaches its climax in the suffering Messiah through whose violent death violence itself is dethroned and new creation unleashed. I believe, in short, that a more historically grounded reading of the Bible, especially of the genuinely apocalyptic themes in the New Testament, is urgent and fortunately available, and that such a reading can help us address some of the major issues with which we're confronted. In a world full of discordant voices, it's time to allow the Bible free reign so that we may learn again the ancient wisdom we need if we are to address our all-too-contemporary difficulties and dangers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. That was excellent, very stimulating, and a foretaste of great things to come tomorrow night and Thursday night. We do have a few minutes for questions. While you're thinking of questions, let me make uh, an announcement to you. You all have been given a couple of pages, this one uh, green colored. In case you want to order one, two, or all three of the lectures, you can do that. You don't need to turn them in now, but you can think about that in the next couple of days, fill it out, drop it off at the table. Also, you have a buff colored uh, evaluation. We'd appreciate it if you take a couple of minutes, either now during Q&A or perhaps later,
during the reception that will be in a few minutes' time right out there in the lobby. Fill this out and drop it off at the book table also. We appreciate it. Okay, time for questions. Who wants to be first? And I'd appreciate it uh, if you make it very clear. If you can get to the mic, it is wireless, that's great. If you can't, we'll repeat it so that everyone can hear it and it can also be recorded. Okay, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to ask the first question? Clyde Lowe. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Uh, I think you clarified it later on, but there was at one point in your lecture where I got the impression, and I, I know I'm wrong, I just want you to clarify for me, that's all, so I can leave here knowing it, that uh, you do believe that we will live eternally and that, that time doesn't mean uh, a limitation on our existence. Is that sure. correct? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think we are promised in the New Testament that we will be given immortality, but it will be a bodied immortality. Amen, yes. And I take that to include something that will meaningfully be uh, able to be called a temporal reality. In other words, we will not disappear into a, a timeless state, which many Christians have just assumed that that's what we're promised. Yes. I see no reason in the New Testament to suppose that that'll be so. Um, but I do not at all, I mean, I think the way that you've asked the question shows how we have allowed ourselves to mm. imagine that, just as we have allowed ourselves mm -hmm. to imagine that having bodies must mean being corruptible and decaying, whereas what we're promised in the New Testament is non-decaying bodies. Yes. Um, Paul talks about being raised immortal and so on. So in the same way we have assumed that to live in time is to decay and finally to come to a stop, whereas in the New Testament I think we are given hints of maybe a new sort of time, just like the resurrection body is a new sort of body, though in yes. continuity with the present one. I, I appreciated uh, those remarks. Uh, because uh, uh, Christianity has been influenced a lot by Platonic thinking sure. and uh, the, the Greeks and so forth. Uh, are you familiar with Randy Alcorn's uh, book on, on heaven? Uh, actually, no, I'm not. Sorry. He, uh, this, uh, what, he addresses, it that, at, he addresses hmm. that at length hmm. and uh, expands mm -hmm. on it a, a little further. So I, I've appreciated I, everything you've said. I'd be week. grateful for the reference to that afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Clyde, very much. I appreciate the comments about the uh, new uh, incorruptible body. I have a disc that's crumbling, and as I stood here <laughs> hearing that, it just <laughs> gave me real feelings of hope. Amen. Mm. Okay, another question. I'll bring it to you. Danny? Dr. Wright, uh, when you were talking, uh, you mentioned ecology or green theology coming out of apocalyptic uh, thinking. Uh, one reference you didn't uh, mention, which I was thinking about when you were saying that, is in uh, Peter, when, when uh, the earth will be consumed by fire. And how does, mm -hmm. how does a green theology come out of that? Because I understand what you're saying, that revelation comes, but there is still a new earth. And so how do we say, take care of this one? The, 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 renewal, the renewal of the earth, I think, which I, I would start with Romans 8, 18 through 27. And on Second Peter, I would say the, the short answer is that on the table at the back, there's a big green book, which is one of the ones that... Um, <laughs> and if you, look up, if you look up the two Peter passage in the index in there, you will find, uh, I think, three or four paragraphs on exactly the question you've raised. At this time of this night, I can't remember all the detail of all those three paragraphs, but I've said it's, it's actually a difficult passage textually. There's some odd words in it which come out differently in different manuscripts, and uh, there is quite a puzzle as to how precisely to take that. But the promise of new heavens and new earth seems to me has to be taken in the context of both the Pauline imagery of the new creation being born from the womb of the old, as in Romans 8, the Johannine image of heaven and earth being like bride and bridegroom, and also the uh, First Corinthians picture in which it is the fulfillment of 
the Creator's good intention in Genesis 1 and 2 that all that defaces and destroys the present creation, i.e. including death itself, will finally be defeated. And when you defeat death, what you do is affirm the goodness of the original creation. At the heart of it all, of course, is the resurrection of Jesus. And what you do and say with and about the resurrection of Jesus will eventually color everything. So that if Jesus' body had stayed in the tomb and Jesus had simply um, gone off as a disembodied soul, that would have one message about the importance of the created order, namely not very much actually. Um, if you'd had simply Jesus being resuscitated um, so that he was a resuscitated corpse rather than a transformed new body, then that would have a different, you, know, you could chase this out in each direction. The critical issue really is, as in a passage like 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul argues for uh, Christian sexual morality on the basis that God raised the Lord and will raise us by his power, therefore your body does not belong to you, it belongs to God, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, you could say, well, this present body will crumble away and God will have to give me a new one, and I think Paul would agree with that. So what's the fuss? And for Paul, there is a great deal of fuss. There is continuity as well as discontinuity. It's hard for us to describe and evaluate that, but it is that continuity, that sense, therefore, that what you do in the present in work for God's kingdom is not wasted. That's the great thing at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, one of the most important verses in the whole letter. He says, you know, let me just expand this for a minute because this is a hugely important question. I didn't see lots of other hands that going up, so let me just take a moment. Um, at the end of this chapter on the resurrection, you might expect Paul to say, therefore, since you've got this wonderful future ahead of you, just sit back and look forward to it, and, and that's wonderful. It's going to be terrific. He doesn't. He says, therefore, get on with your work in the present because whatever you do in the present is not wasted. Um, uh, in other words, you are not simply oiling the wheels of a machine that's going to drop over a cliff. What you do in the present in working for God's kingdom will, though transformed, have continuity with the eventual new world that God is going to make. That's the larger biblical context within which you have to deal with the very tricky little problem of 2, P 2 Peter 3. But thank you for asking the question. I'm, I really appreciate that. He's still got the microphone. Be careful. He may have another dangerous verse up his sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else. Unless there is, could I? Oops, are we off over here? Okay, yeah. sure. Could you stand so folks could see? Uh, first off, I just want to say that was really good. I really enjoyed that. I guess my question is, um, if the, the, the apocalyptic, as you were talking about, as maybe a series of events, as opposed to what we seem to think of it as, as one world-ending, you know, huge catastrophic event, and if that's the case, and Christ is an example of of that unveiling of God's curtain or His plan, uh, I'm just interested. Do you have any theories, or or maybe any? Is there any more biblical evidence as to maybe take a shot in the dark as to what a next unveiling of God's plan would? Oh. Ah. Um, it depends what you mean. Uh, let me be quite clear. I do think there will come a time when whatever this means in reality, when the earth shall be full of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea in a way which is not currently the case. I do think there will be a time when the reality which is prophesied in the imagery of Romans 8 and Revelation 21 and, and 1 Corinthians 15, when we will say, this is it. This is not an anticipation. This is the reality. I really do think that there will come that time. So that will be the great moment, and all other anticipatory moments will be seen in that light to be partial and fitful and ambiguous and so on. And I think it's hugely important to say that from the Christian perspective, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is obviously closely conjoined with it in the New Testament, is the great event that we look back to, and the event that I've just described, which we can only get at through that symbol and imagery, is the next great event, and that all other events in between, whether they're stages in church history or stages in world history or whatever, are um, 
have to be interpreted within that grid. So it, I don't see it in terms of great dispensations, that there were 500 years which were like this and another 1,000 years which were like that and so on. No doubt you can plot various movements within history, though usually those are, are rather oversimple schemes, which like modern and postmodern, which we label periods with. Actually, the world is much more complex and, and multi-layered than that. And I think it's just always important to go back and see who we are as um, implementing God's achievement in the death and resurrection of Jesus and anticipating God's achievement in the final renewal of all things. That's the tension within which Christian life is held. But I do think then, coming down to the specifics, that we in contemporary Western culture live at a moment where all sorts of people, for all sorts of reasons, artists, politicians, uh, all sorts of people, are asking really hard questions about where on earth are we in our culture. The big stories have let us down, and we really don't know how to go forward from here. And wouldn't it be tragic if at that moment of all moments the Christian church had nothing to say except, yeah, it's a puzzle to us too. You know? We have to be able to say something about God's fresh purposes for the human race at a moment like this. Dr. McDonald, do you want to ask your question? If you wish, go okay. right ahead. Okay, well, I was more than willing to <laughs> give that time up. Uh, uh, there's a, a phrase that I know you're quite familiar with, and uh, Rudolf Bultmann made use of it uh, in Presence of Eternity, and George Ladd, uh, uh, they said almost the same words with totally different meanings, and I was wondering how you would relate to the already but not yet that the presence of eternity has broken into the present sphere through the activity of God and Jesus, and yet it's not altogether here yet. Could you make a well, comment or two about that? Yes, thought? except, you see, I wouldn't say the presence of eternity because I, I, I'm anxious about what we import when we use that word eternity because of the, 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 the sodden Platonism of, of modernist culture. Um, and I think we just have to deconstruct the way we've done But anyway... I would say God's future has already broken into the present in Jesus Christ. Um, but, of course, classically, the people who were writing about that in the first century were themselves um, being persecuted, being imprisoned, uh, subject to all the, the, the vagaries of an angry politics and, 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 a, and, a capricious, and apparently capricious uh, seascape, Paul being shipwrecked and so on. In other words, when Paul was talking about the fact that Jesus is already Lord of the powers and that on his cross Jesus led the principalities and powers as a defeated rabble in his triumphal procession, this is the same Paul who is facing all kinds of discouragements and anxieties and so on, so that you've got now and not yet, already and not yet, built into the very structure of Pauline theology. And so um, I couldn't, again, at this time of this night, give you the nice analysis which clearly you've got in your head of the difference between Bultmann's already not yet and George Eldon Ladd's already not yet, and I shall ask you about that afterwards, if I may. Um, <laughs> But I mean, it's very interesting and important. Um, I, I would say it like this, that the already is rooted in the fact of Easter and the gift of the Spirit, and that the not yet is what we all live with day by day and know perfectly well, that we are hindered and hampered and our own uh, bits and pieces of semi-idolatry or whatever it is, is constantly letting us down so that we are not able to do and live as Christians in the way that we would like to. Nevertheless, the reality of Jesus' resurrection, the reality of the gift of the Spirit, does enable us to do things which would not otherwise be possible. A new era really did dawn when Jesus of, of Nazareth came out of the tomb on Easter morning. And when God finally does at the end for the whole of creation what he did for Jesus at Easter, which is what I take it Romans 8 is all about, then and only then the not yet will be done away with and we will have a complete already. And that's where I would at least start. We have time for one last brief question right back here. Um, Dr. Wright, I want to thank you very much. You're the most interesting biblical scholar I've ever listened to. <laughs> Um, I do come from a, I'm an amateur, don't, don't mistake this, <laughs> I'm not an expert or a professional, but I do come from a, a way of thinking about things which I would call a, a kind of philosophical, theological way, which I find uh, very fulfilling and interesting. And so anyway, I wasn't going to say this, but uh, when you did refer to the sodden Platonism of the postmodern world, I, I suspect the, the, that... The, mo the modern world. Yeah. Oh, the modern world. Yeah. Oh, all right. 
okay? But there is a Platonism in the contemporary or postmodern world as well. And I, I just only, I only want to uh, raise the question of that there may be certain forms of Platonism or understandings of it, I should say, which, um, which um, give rise to the kinds of statements that are made which put it in a kind of uh, radical opposition to biblical ways of thinking. But, uh, you know, there is a vast world of uh, contemporary neoplatonic scholarship which is really saying the same thing that you are, I think, is insofar as I can understand it. And through these the Platonic categories, which I think are understood in a somewhat perhaps different way than... than uh, would you like the, to enlighten us on that? It's very I'd be interested to know which writers you're thinking of because um, uh, the, the, the disjunction that I'm making, I, which I hope is clear and not particularly controversial, is that Ultimately, in Platonism, the, the world of space, time, and matter is, is a secondary, rather shabby sort of place which we would be happy to escape from. There's somebody at the back who I think wants to contribute to this very... Is this on, this very, on the same point? Do, oh, well, so, sorry, but, but he's trying to flag you down, but we might just, just catch that as well. He's very eager to get in. But um, I, I'd be interested to know which, which writers you're thinking of because within... Uh, and it seems to me one of the things that the resurrection is all about, and when I wrote that big book on the resurrection, it's one of the things I realized was coming through the people I was reading, the early fathers, the rabbis, etc. that resurrection is the reaffirmation of the goodness of the, the, the universe of space, time, and matter. And the flight from resurrection over the last two centuries has had very little, in fact, to do, though many critical scholars have supposed it does, with the fact that we now live in the modern world, we have modern science, so we know dead people don't rise. I mean, that's, that's rubbish, of course. Um, everybody from the, the very early on, Homer, etc., has known that dead people don't rise. So that um, we, we've seen this sort of sense that we don't actually want to have a body again because we know we want something else, eternity, a spiritual existence. And it's that sort of Platonizing which I think is soaked into the very fabric of the church. L let, let me come back to you in the break and, and ask for some references because that would be interesting to follow up. C can, can, we just, can we just take this chap at the back? Thank you. Thanks very much. A uh, quick question. Uh, something I wrote down, I just want to see if I wrote down what was correct. Right? I wrote that uh, you'd said early Christians did not believe the space-time continuum was about to end, but that something new was being revealed. Is, is that... Is that uh, accurate? More or less, yes, yes. Okay, okay. I just wanted to yeah. double check here. And that um, they didn't think of the imminent return of Christ? Ah, no, that's very different. I wasn't okay. talking about that. Th uh, I think the early Christians thought that Jesus might return at any time, which meant it could well be tomorrow, but that it didn't have to be. The, the passages which say within, within a generation um, are classically the passages like Mark 9, 1 and Mark 13 and the parallels in Matthew and Luke. And uh, they need to be very carefully studied because I think they've been woefully misunderstood over the last century, particularly since and under the influence of Albert Schweitzer. And I think that the, uh, the event which Jesus was referring forwards to is the complex of several things, including what was going to happen to him, his own death and resurrection. Because if I'm interpreting his resurrection aright, resurrection is the establishment of the fact there is now a human being who is running the world under God's uh, sovereignty, which is the coming of the kingdom in that sense, but also in Mark 13, the overthrow of Jerusalem. And Mark 13 starts with a question about when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed, and it ends with the answer within a generation. And the fact that all the apocalyptic language about the Son of Man and so on is festooned around that has given people, I think, the, mis the misleading idea that they, were th that they thought this was the second coming. Never forget that the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is an upwards, not a downwards movement which I know is um, deeply troubling for some, but there we are. it's probably an excellent place on which to end. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm.